All right, hi everybody, I'm Spencer, and today we are going to be talking about tomographies of both quantum states and quantum processes. So before we begin, I just want to make a quick note that everything we discuss today <coughs> can be found in more detail, either in Jeffrey Altpeter's thesis on the Quiag Group website, or in Nielsen and Chuang's quantum information book. Okay, so just a quick outline of what we'll be talking about today. We're going to start with a lightning review of sort of the basics of what we'll need to be, we need to know about to, for our discussion. So polarization and the Poincaré sphere, kind of mixed states and density matrices, as well as how we actually go about taking measurements in the lab. And then from there we can move on to actually discussing the specifics of how one goes about doing, performing a state tomography and a process tomography. All right, beginning with polarization. So as I'm sure everybody is familiar with, all pure polarization states can actually be represented as points along the surface of a sphere. The Poincaré sphere, to be specific, where orthogonal polarizations are treated as antipodal points on the sphere. So as we can see here, horizontal and vertical are across from each other, diagonal and anti-diagonal, as well as left and right circular polarization. And any linear combination of these states can, again, just be represented as a point. The reason that this picture is super useful <coughs> is because any unitary transformation we make actually acts to just rotate points on the sphere. So for our specific <coughs> examples, a half-wave plate that we use will act to just rotate points on the sphere by 180 degrees. If we take a half-wave plate with its fast and slow axis in diagonal and anti-diagonal, then a point at starting at horizontal will be rotated all the way and become a vertical polarized photon afterwards. Similarly, quarter wave plates act to rotate the sphere by 90 degrees instead of 180 degrees. So if we have a quarter wave plate with its fast and slow axis at H and V, then we can go from linear polarizations such as anti-diagonal and rotate it to a circular polarization. Now, we can also convert back and forth, say, going from circular to linear polarization, and this is kind of the basis of how we'll be performing measurements in which we'll rotate what are given points, say, right-hand circularly polarized, down to the linear polarization plane, and then we can use a polarizer to project onto whatever linear polarization we want. Now, discussing mixed states, because so far we've only talked about pure states. So mixed states. Pure states we kind of you know, are already familiar with. It's just some linear combination of horizontal and vertical. But oftentimes due to you know, imperfections in our system, we don't actually just have one pure state coming out. Oftentimes we'll end up with some statistical mixture. And how, how do we actually want to deal with this? The answer is with matrices. Basically, this is just a combination of pure states that we've weighted probabilistically. So that's why we have to require that the trace of this matrix is equal to 1. That sets it so that the probability of any measurement we make on it will always add up to 1. Uh, some examples. Horizontally polarized light, relatively straightforward. It's just a 1 in the top left diagonal or top left corner. We can move on to another pure state, anti-diagonal. Here we have one half in both portions of the diagonal, corresponding to the fact that we have equal weighting of horizontal and vertical in our state. And then the minus one halves in each of the off-diagonal components correspond to the phase between horizontal and vertical. Anti-diagonal being H minus V, we have minus one halves in each of those. But those are again both pure states. So representing though a mixed state, we can do something like completely unpolarized light. Light which has no coherence between the horizontal and vertical components, in which case we just get an identity matrix with one half in both portions of the diagonal, but zero on the off diagonal. The reason we have zero on the off diagonal is, of course, because, like I said, we have no coherence between the two terms, or between the horizontal and vertical components of our light, and therefore the phase between them randomizes and averages to zero. Now, 
<laughs> what, like we said, the pure states are all the states on the surface of the Poincaré sphere. Mixed states will be all of the points inside the Poincaré sphere, with unpolarized light being at the very center of the sphere. Okay, so in an experiment, how are we actually going to measure any of these states? The answer is going to be the answer is basically that we just project our state, whatever state we have, onto some set of known states. <clears throat> And to do that, we'll use quarter wave plates, half wave plates, and polarizers to <laughs> rotate whatever our desired projection state is onto something that we can use a polarizer or a PVS to project out and then put it into a detector. <coughs> In practice, there are two methodologies for how <coughs> to go about this. You can either use a quarter wave plate and a polarizer in which case the quarter wave plate allows you to rotate any polarization state onto a linear polarization state, and then the polarizer projects onto the desired linear polarization state. Or you can alternatively use a quarter wave plate, half wave plate, and polarizing beam splitter. This accomplishes a similar goal in which the quarter wave plate and half wave plate are used to rotate your desired state onto horizontal and then the polarizing beam splitter transmits the desired projection state and reflects the orthogonal state. <clears throat> now the advantage of this setup is that you can measure both st the orthogonal state and the desired state at the same time, saving you measurements. But it's a little bit more complicated to set up since you have to couple in two, si two detectors. Now to switch what basis we're operating in, you can just rotate polarizer for the quarter wave plate, or not to switch what uh, state we're measuring, rather. Rotate the polarizer. If we want to move <coughs> to a different basis, we can just change the wave plates and the polarizer to fit into the DA basis, or alternatively, the LR basis. And be, with this methodology, like I said, we can project onto essentially any state on the Poincaré sphere we want, so long as we have ideal wave plates and polarizers. A little bit later, we'll talk about how you can deal with non-ideal projectors. But for now, we're going to assume that you can hit all of these H, V, D, A, L, and R. <clears throat> OK, so that was an introduction. Now let's actually start talking about tomographies, specifically state tomographies. Now, what is a state tomography, and why do we want to do it? So let's say you have some unknown quantum state and you need to, well, figure it out what it is. Could be coming from your, just your laser, the output of an entanglement source, anything. You don't have no idea of figuring out what it is. You can't measure that directly. So we perform a tomography. Now the idea of a tomography is that rather than measuring it directly, we're going to see how that state overlaps with a bunch of different states that create can form a basis. And then we'll use those statistics to reconstruct the original state. Now, in the ideal case, where everything is perfect, <coughs> this is pretty straightforward. Essentially, what we're doing is we're trying to find the coordinates of the state on the Poincaré sphere. So to do that, much like you could in any coordinate system, we want to project it onto the different axes of our Poincaré sphere so we can measure a projection, see where it lies on the LR axis, where it lies on the HV axis, and where it lies on the DA axis. And once we have that, we have a uniquely determined point, and we have our state. Now, since we're dealing with probabilities here along these axes, not actual photon counts, but you're measuring photon counts, this requires four total measurements. One for each of the actual axes you're measuring, and then one as a sort of ortho in an orthogonal um, state so that you can normalize probabilities. So for example, you'll measure H and D and L for one for each axis, but then you'll also want to measure R because L plus R would be the total number of photons you're measuring, and you can use that to normalize all of your probabilities and find the probability for V and A. But, like I said, this is completely ideal. This is assuming you have no Poissonian statistics of light, no imperfections in your system, nothing. 
So there are some experimental considerations to be taken into account. The first problem is simply that your power may fluctuate over time. So for example, if you measure your L, project onto L, and then say you have, for an example, you know, 100 microwatts going through your system. Then you switch to your R measurement, but suddenly the power from your laser drops because of, you know, power goes weird or something, and you are only have 50 microwatts coming through. Now, if you measure the same thing at the output, you'd be thinking, okay, hey, my state is completely balanced. But no, it's not. You have actually twice as much um, of one unstate as the other. So the solution is simply just to, if you use a PBS instead of a polarizer, it allows you to measure both states at once, and then any fluctuations <coughs> will happen for both states simultaneously. Now, this isn't necessarily a big problem for most systems since you're not going to be having 50% you know, power fluctuations over the course of your tomography, but it's something to keep in mind. Second, you could have a problem where transmission through your system and efficiency may not be the same for each basis. This is a problem that we encountered when we were working with orbital angular momentum modes, where we could only couple in linear modes about half as well as circular modes. In which case, using one set of bases in order to normalize everything suddenly doesn't work anymore because then you know, you could have twice as many counts for a single measurement, but it actually corresponds to half the probability. Then the solution there is simple. It's what we always do. You just take six measurements. You measure in all of the desired states you want to project onto, rather than using the statistics to get you your measurements. And lastly, kind of the biggest problem with the tomography setup that we talked about before is that these just projections can actually end up giving you unphysical states when you start having errors, particularly if your input state is a pure state, then it lies on the Poincaré sphere. And so any error in your projection can actually bring it outside of the Poincaré sphere into lands of unphysical, non-polarization based quantum states. So the way we actually want to deal with that is going to be the topic of our next discussion. We're going to use maximum likelihood estimation or Bayesian tomography. So this is what all of the code we have running in the lab works off of. We'll be focusing primarily today on maximum likelihood estimation, simply because it's the primary use case for this lab. And I'm going to apologize in advance. We're going to be jumping into a bit of math going forward. But for if this doesn't make a whole lot of sense, don't worry too much because this is what the computer, generally speaking, will just handle. So what is a maximum likelihood estimation? The idea behind maximum likelihood is that we have some probability distribution defined by a parameter we don't know. We have the output of some set of measurements from the distribution, but we don't have, the, but we want to find the parameter that defines it. Examples being, you know, if, say, we want to find the weighting of a coin. We don't know if it's, you know, 50-50 heads, tails, 90-10 heads, tails, or whatever. Or, I mean, in this case, we have some just list of measurements, list of counts from different projections, and we want to know what quantum state was most likely to have given that. So to do that, we construct what's called the likelihood function. This is just a mathematical probability density that gives the probability of the outcome we saw given a model for our parameters. Now, usually this will just split up. So a product of probabilities, you know, the probability that we got n heads times the probability we got n tails, something like that but each one written in terms of the parameters that we're looking for. And generally speaking, we'll actually instead use what's called the log likelihood, which as the name implies, is just the logarithm of the likelihood function. The reason that we want to do this is because <coughs> A, 
it turns the product of our probabilities into a sum, which is significantly more numerically stable, and we will be using numerics to solve these problems. And second, as we'll see in the case of tomographies, this actually simplifies the likelihood function drastically. And finally, all we have to do is maximize L with respect to all of our parameters. And then that tells us what parameter was most likely to have given us the data that we saw. Okay, so we'll, we'll talk about this in terms of a exa concrete example because it's a little bit esoteric. But let's say, as I mentioned before, we want to find the weight aiding of a coin. Now, obviously, the kind of naive method is just you flip it a bunch of times, record the number of heads, record the number of tails, that tells you the probability. So let's see if that lines up with how a maximum likelihood approach would work for this. So in this case, we have done just that. We've flipped a coin, we've flipped it a bunch of times, we have some number of tails, some number of heads. <coughs> and the probability of having received this number of heads and tails we got is just the probability of a heads to the power of the number of heads times the probability of the number of tails to the power of the number of tails. Now, I've thrown out the combinatorial factor here because in terms of a maximum likelihood estimate, that doesn't matter. It just ends up washing out and we don't care about it, so it's a lot simpler to just ignore it. And then we can take the log of it. We get our product breaks up into a sum. And if we maximize this with respect to theta, we, should, we get that theta is just equal to the number of heads over the number of flips you did, which is exactly what one would expect the weighting of a coin to be. Obviously, the accuracy of this gets better the more flips you, uh, you make, or rather the precision. All right, so how is this gonna affect tomography? So in a tomography, we have some number of counts for H, V, D, A, L, and R. And we want to know what state was the most likely state to have generated these counts. <coughs> so the way we're going to do that is we're going to make some test quantum state. Just basically a, a quantum state that is filled with variables for all of its, in, all of its entries. And then we're going to take this test state and we're going to perform the same projections <laughs> mathematically onto all of the measurement states that we made. And each of these will give us a probability, and we can use that probability to get a sort of test number of counts that would have happened if we had used this tunable state. Okay? And then from there, if those are the if each of those values, these n bars, are the what the, I guess, theoretical number of counts we would have expected to see given that state, then the probability of having gotten that number of counts in our experiment looks like this Gaussian distribution. It's Gaussian because photon statistics are Poissonian, which is not Gaussian, but for a large number of photons, large number of counts, a Gaussian function well approximates Poissonian statistics. So it's significantly easier computationally to just use a Gaussian approximation. But with each of these probabilities, the likelihood function is just a product of them all. And so we max, we tune, basically we will be tuning our test state around to maximize this probability, to basically make it so that the counts that our test state would have given are as close to the counts we got in every single category as possible. So we're going to make a small digression here before we finish up um, states just talking about imperfect projectors. <coughs> so if you say you know your wave plates aren't perfect, you may not have exactly a half wave plate, exactly a quarter wave plate, then you're not going to actually be able to project exactly onto H, V, D, A, L, and R. But that's not really a problem. Because as long as the three bases you choose, as long as the six states you choose, 
can still span this Poincaré sphere. That is, as long as you can still write any uh, state in the Poincaré sphere as a linear combination of your states, then you can still perform a tomography. Now, you may need to run the tomography for longer, simply because if, say, you have these axes I've depicted here, two of them are giving you basically the same information all of the time, just with a little bit of difference. And so you're going to need more and more counts to get actually get a good amount, the same amount of information as you would have gotten, say, just using our standard basics. In terms of how that actually affects the tomography, it's relatively simple. All you have to do is when you're construct projecting your test state onto the different um, measurements, all you do is change those projections to be the states that you actually have available to you, such that the states you measured match the states that you tuned to. All right, so let's let's now just go through a recipe for state tomography. So what, what you need to do in order to just hammer one out. First, you're going to start, obviously, by choosing your projectors. So that's going to be three bases, two orthogonal states per basis. And then you're going to use your quarter wave plates, your half wave plates, your polarizers, to project onto each of these states and get some number of counts. <clears throat> now, if you're just using tomography code, then at this point you will put said numbers into the code, they'll spit out a density matrix, and you can go home happy. What's happening inside the code is the code will create a t some tunable state. This is going to be the, kind of the standard, since this is, this is a way of generating a positive permission um, trace, tr unity trace matrix with four variables. This just ensures that any state that comes out of the maximum likelihood is always physical. The program will then project that, this state, onto all of the measurements you made. And it'll maximize the likelihood function, comparing them all in a, what, yeah, comparing them all in a rational manner and maximize tuning the T1 through 4 and the output variables that you get can be just plugged back into this formula and it'll spit out the resulting density. 